I've got to be honest, this is kind of a boring weapon. Design-wise, it's ugly. A couple of rectangles overlapped, like a gun drawn by a child. And yet, for some reason, it's quite popular. The Glock. A polymer-framed pistol hailing from Austria, and perhaps the most successful of the Wonder Nines. So, how did an obscure Austrian plastic manufacturer have such an impact on the arms industry? What was so special about Glock's design? And are they really invisible to X-rays? During World War II, Austria's service pistol was the Walther P38, a perfectly serviceable semi-auto pistol, and it retained its role for some time after the war. However, by the late 1970s there were better alternatives, and the Austrian armed forces began seeking a replacement pistol in 1980. The most likely contender at this time was the Steyr GB, designed in 1968 and boasting some novel features but it faced stiff competition from other European manufacturers such as Beretta and Sig Sauer. But surely the Austrians would select a homegrown weapon, and Steyr were pretty much the only Austrian arms manufacturer going. It was a shoo-in. However, there was an outsider. A man named Gaston Glock. He was the founder of a small manufacturing company based in Deutsche Wagram that made polymer products, originally curtain rods and doorknobs. By the late 1970s, Glock had found a niche in products for the military, entrenching tools, knives and disintegrating links. They'd never made any firearms before, but when Glock caught wind of the upcoming tender for a replacement pistol, he decided to design his own. He was guided by the standard set by the Austrian Ministry of Defence. The new weapon had to be a 9mm semi-auto. High capacity, ambidextrous, drop safe, easy to maintain, and of simple, interchangeable construction. Unhindered by any preconception or existing tooling, this was an entirely new pistol designed to an exacting specification. He called it the Glock 17 as it was his 17th invention. That its magazine capacity was 17 rounds was serendipity. In 1982, Glock submitted his handgun design to the Austrian military for testing, where it would be up against heavyweights such as Six Hours P220 and 226, HK's P7, and the Beretta 92. The prize was an order of 25,000 units. And somehow, the rank outsider clinched it. Glock's design proved its capability, outperforming all of its rivals. Now, the Americans had just settled on the Beretta, so news of a hitherto unknown name in firearms beating established manufacturers was surprising to say the least. There was concern that the high-capacity magazine would prove useful for criminals, and that the plastic frame would be invisible on airport x-ray machines. It was described as tailor-made for terrorists. However, most of these fears were unfounded. The metal components of the Glock are still quite recognisable as a firearm, and by now, high-capacity weapons were the norm. Eventually, the resistance to the Glock dissipated. After all, you can't keep a good design down, and more and more police and military forces realised the Glock's potential with the weapon seeing rapid adoption throughout the 1990s. The plastic pistol from Austria was ready for the silver screen. Die Hard 2 wasn't the first film the Glock made an appearance in, but it's probably the first memorable one. The fictional Glock 7 is described as a porcelain gun made in Germany that doesn't show up on your airport x-ray machines and costs more than what you make in a month. The quote is wrong on almost every count. But the gun was new, and it was cool. As its popularity surged, the Glock became an increasingly common sight, often seen in the hands of fictional law enforcement, such as in Robocop 3, The Fugitive, and Beverly Hills Cop 3. Fellow Austrian Arnold Schwarzenegger was reportedly a fan, and the Glock makes an appearance in True Lies, Eraser, and End of Days. Even the word Glock itself became a byword for firepower, 
a frequent reference in gangster rap, such as Ice-T's OG original Gangster, Dr. Dre's Let Me Ride, and Ice Cube's You Know How We Do It. Right from the start, the pistol has refused stereotype. Civilian, police, military, terrorist, gangbanger. The Glock is for everyone. This universal appeal was helped by a large number of variants, model numbers starting with the 17 and ascending. The Glock 18, a fully automatic machine pistol. The 19 with compact frame. 20 made for the hard-hitting 10mm auto round. 21 in 45 ACP. The 22, 23 and 24 in 40 Smith & Wesson. The 25 in 380 ACP. And the 26, a subcompact Glock in 9mm, ideal for concealed carry. The list goes on. A whole range of calibres, a whole range of sizes. Despite some issues with the earlier 40 cal models, mostly a consequence of hotter than usual rounds, Glock's original design has proven quite adaptable. And today, the pistol for everyone is everywhere. Naturally, this means they're a popular choice for video games, and the Glock is one of the more attainable weapons within a typical arsenal. However, being a pistol, it's often sidelined to a secondary role, a backup to your SMG or assault rifle. It's not a glamorous job, but such is the pistol's lot. But in the early days of the FPS, lower-ranking weapons within the power hierarchy got their share of attention by being the first weapons you got to play with. This coincides with the Glock's rapid rise in popularity during the late 90s. So, early appearances in games like Duke Nukem 3D and Half-Life aren't too surprising. As more realistic games took hold, we start to see a reflection of the Glock's popularity with law enforcement and military units. Games like SWAT 4, the Delta Force and Rainbow Six series all feature the Glock in some form. Of course, it's not always called the Glock in games. It is a commercial trademark, so it's often changed to avoid legal trouble. Most often, the Glock 17 will be known as the G17, or perhaps as one of its military designations. In some cases where firearms are less of a focus, it might be entirely generic, the 9mm pistol or similar. There's no mistaking its boxy exterior though, the Glock's familiarity is its key distinction. The entire Glock lineup is broadly similar, they all look and behave in pretty much the same way. But there is one exception, the forbidden Glock 18. It is disproportionately popular in games, probably because it's more interesting and exciting than the semi-automatic pistols it resembles. In gameplay terms, it fills an interesting role that not many other recognisable weapons can. A pocket-sized auto, seldom controllable, but always quite good fun. The Akimbo Glocks from Modern Warfare 2 are a particularly memorable example. They were surprisingly effective, even without the ability to aim. So as dull as pistols can be, there's something to like about the Glock. A utilitarian charm. It's just a gun. It's just a gun that does its job extraordinarily well. It's lost its exotic edge. No longer is it the plastic European wonder that changed America's outlook on handguns. But it's matured into a modern classic that might just outlast us all. So. Welcome to the default option, a versatile pistol with broad appeal. It's true, there are better looking weapons out there, and some more suited to specific roles. But there's a Glock good enough for everyone. Besides, sometimes ugly is beautiful, and sometimes boring is exactly what you need. The Glock. Neutral. Universal. Perfect. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, farewell. <laughs>